Hello everyone. Let me welcome you to today's session of the course, The History of English Language and Literature. In today's lecture, we are continuing to look at the long 18th century, focusing on the age of Johnson, which lasted from 1745 till 1798. In the uh, last couple of sessions, we had also been looking at how the early 18th century had been fashioned, what were the major uh, influences, socio-political, religious, societal, other scientific elements, how the age of enlightenment also contributed to the development of English uh, language and literature. Uh, we had been looking, taking a look at all of these things in the last couple of sessions and today we continue to look at how the latter part of the century has been uh, framed and has been fashioned in terms of its uh, writings, in terms of its uh, uh, literary influences, the various shifting tendencies of uh, uh, of the people, the politics, the writings, so on and so forth. In the beginning of the 18th century, there was also a moral reaction against the uh, license which followed the restoration uh, period. We noticed that much of the writings of this period was also characterized by uh, characterized with this reactionary nature. And we saw how it was also dominated by the formalism of the age of a uh, pope, uh, during which uh, period reason and good uh, sense prevailed as the guiding principles. And there was also a deep distrust of the emotions and the feelings. Writings, um, writings accordingly had become uh, harder and drier in comparison uh, with the earlier times. As a result of the reactionary forces against the uh, the, against the elements of uh, restoration drama and the licentiousness of the period, people also developed a certain kind of dread against earnestness and enthusiasm. Accordingly, there was also a domination of flippancy, uh, cynicism and the age in general was considered as uh, mostly self-complacent. And uh, this is also reflected in the writings of uh, Addison and Steele, which also had a minor form of social criticism. We also saw it heavily getting reflected in the writings of Swift, uh, which was uh, uh, mostly misanthropist in nature. In the context of all these uh, changes and all these uh, uh, movements which were coming about, Hudson remarks, the new generation now in its turn reacted against the smug self-complacency, the chilliness and the aridity of the preceding age. So we begin to see that by the mid uh, 18th century, there is again a reaction, a sort of a, a response against the dominant tone of flippancy, the dominant tone of uh, uh, cynicism and also the formalism and the dryness which had crept into the writings of the times. So just as we have noted in the uh, discussion of our uh, previous centuries, every age seems to react to the preceding age in some form or the other. So whatever happens in the latter half of the 18th century is again uh, yet another reaction to the uh, tendencies of the early 18th century. So the generation which came after the age of a uh, Pope, they were weary of the long continued artificiality and also displayed a lot of discontent with a uh, formalism. So we also find them reacting against the shallow philosophy of the Augustan age. But the uh, writers who were writing during the age of Pope, which was also known as the Augustan age, they strongly believed that they were following the tenets of uh, the uh, ancient uh, classical writings. They also thought that they were more philosophical and they were more profound and in-depth than their uh, predecessors. We also find them reacting against uh, even the writings of the golden period, the uh, Elizabethan age. Uh, uh, in, in, in that sense, Having witnessed how the writings had uh, become more formalist, more uh, imitative to the classical tendencies, we find that the generation after Pope craving for something more natural and spontaneous and not intellectual and artificial. So in uh, that sense, we also witness a renaissance of feelings uh, during this time and accordingly this age is also uh, seen as a, an, an age of transition which marked the changes from the formalist tendencies of the age of Pope towards the uh, towards the more spontaneous uh, uh, towards the more uh, spontaneous expressiveness of the romantic age which is yet to come for example this sort of change was uh, seen in almost all uh, all uh, spectrums of life including religion uh, we find that there was a, a sort of evangelistic uh, revival which uh, swept across uh, britain during this time uh, it was led by uh, primarily by wesley and whitefield uh, we find that uh, we find hudson talking about it in a very interesting way uh, he notes uh, the evangelists cared nothing for decorum and the proprieties where the eternal destiny of the soul was at stake. So, uh, uh, so even in the religious discussions and the religious tendencies of those times, 
And we find a marked difference in the sense that in the early 18th century, the focus was more uh, on convincing someone through an argument. But in the latter half with this evangelistic revival, we find that there is also a focus on uh, trying to move by feeling rather than by arguments and through uh, rational rather than through rational arguments. One of the major events which also uh, marked the beginning of such an evangelistic revival was the successful staging of uh, this particular play, Handel's a Messiah, uh, in 1743 in one of the stages in London. This was hugely successful and later historians do note this event as an index of the coming age. In the latter half of the 18th century, we also find a prolific spreading of the humanitarian spirit. We find a rapid growth of democracy, which is also a, a, a phenomenon which we witness in other parts of Europe as well, as well. And we also find that people begin to celebrate the ideals of liberty, equality uh, and rights and also they begin to expose the evils of the existing social state. So compared to the previous age which, which was more cynical in its response to uh, most of these evils which were happening in society. We find that the present age, the, uh, the, the generation which was living during the latter half of the 18th century, we find them more responsive and trying to stage a lot of protests uh, protest against the existing uh, evils in society. So in that sense, it was also a period of a lot of social and political unrest. We find people reacting against the brutality of the system, brutality of the society in general. And there is there's also an increased stress on individuality and qualities of character. We also find that there is an increased stress on individuality and qualities of character. People begin to focus on things which are acquired rather than, rather than the qualities which are acquired by birth and uh, through breeding. So there is a lot of uh, moving away from the, uh, uh, from the aspects of nobility, from the aspects of aristocracy and focusing on the individual irrespective of the background from which uh, each one has hailed from. And we also find uh, the tremendous influence of uh, Rousseau and we also know that he was the one who, uh, uh, who uh, influenced the French Revolution uh, quite a lot. And we find that the uh, Rousseau's uh, influence is uh, particularly seen in the way in which the writers are uh, the writers are responding to his call to go back to nature. So we find that at a later point, even uh, at, with the advent of Romanticism, this uh, uh, this influence was uh, quite profound and visible throughout the uh, throughout the writings and throughout the uh, various sort of uh, cultural reflections. On the whole, we find that in the latter half of the 18th century, after the age of uh, Pope. Uh, the writers, the thinkers and major influential uh, cultural, uh, uh, major influential uh, cultural proponents of those uh, time, they challenge the powerful traditions of the preceding Augustan age. One of the most important figures of this period uh, was Samuel Johnson, so much so that the age itself gets named as the age of Johnson. He lived from 1709 to 1784 and is considered as the greatest English man of letters after Pope and before Wordsworth. So he also signaled a certain kind of transition not just in literary writings but also in the development of language. He was uh, born as the son of a bookseller. He worked as a school usher for a time. He also did uh, in, the, in the earlier days of his uh, career in order to make a living. He also did some translation for a Birmingham publisher. Uh, we also get to know that he uh, married a widow who was 20 years his senior and after a while uh, together as a family they tried to establish a school of their own but it was quite unsuccessful. He also falls into a lot of misfortune as a result of that and in between he's also leaved, uh, he's also forced to leave college which was uh, uh, the Pembroke College in Oxford uh, due to lack of funds. And as a result of these many unkindly things which were happening in his life and the unpromising way in which his life was, uh, way in which his life was moving ahead, in 1737 he decides to move to London to try his uh, fortune. It is uh, said that he moved to London with just uh, uh, two with, with just two pence and half a penny in his uh, pocket. He, however, was fortunate to have the company of David Garrick, who was also a former pupil of his, and he also had uh, uh, later become one of the most uh, renowned actors of those uh, times. He was fortunate to have the company of David Garrick, with whom he is also said to have lived for uh, a while until he could establish himself in uh, London. If you look at the career of uh, 
Johnson, we note that he was uh, many things rolled into one. He was a poet, an essayist, a moralist, a literary critic, a biographer, an editor, a lexicographer, because of which the historians do feel that he was arguably the most distinguished man of letters in English history. In terms of his religious beliefs and his political affiliations, it's important to note that he was a devout Anglican, he was a committed Tory and in terms of his literary achievements, he is also considered as a great sham of literature and he was also an acknowledged uh, dictator of those times when it came to matters of literature, uh, culture, society and uh, all things related to letters. About his personality, there was uh, a lot of uh, people have noted about a strange uh, phenomenon. Many have written about how some of his odd gestures and texts were seen as disconcerting to many uh, who came to visit him. It was also the result of him uh, not developing uh, good relationships with some of his contemporaries. Uh, later historians have also assumed uh, uh, perhaps uh, that he had this uh, uh, Tourette's syndrome which was a certain kind of a neuro disorder which was uh, not yet diagnosed then. So, uh, his uh, uh, some of the unusual kind of behavioral patterns that Johnson uh, displayed, it could have been because of this uh, tourist, uh, Tourette uh, syndrome which was not diagnosed. Talking about his literary capabilities, he, uh, first, uh, he published his first poem in 1738, it was also titled London. This uh, poem had 263 lines and uh, since he was a very avid uh, admirer of the classicist, uh, this was an imitation of Juvenal, uh, the Roman poet. The first poem uh, was published anonymously and it uh, also ran into multiple editions and he was also fortunate to have received much critical acclaim from Pope who did believe that he was uh, one of the greatest writers of those times. And Johnson himself in fact was increasingly unhappy with the first edition which was published in 1738. We find him revising it again in 1748 uh, much to the discomfort of uh, many others who felt that the first one was much better than the uh, later revised edition. And uh, in this poem, we find a certain uh, a kind of a nostalgic glorification of English history uh, in a sense that he was uh, trying to praise the, uh, the earlier governments and the earlier monarchs in comparison with the, uh, the present ones who were ruling the 18th century and because of which he also ran into a lot of controversy with the Hanoverian government and uh, Robert Walpole who was the uh, Prime Minister de facto. It is also useful to remember that. Uh, uh, the government was mostly a uh, Whig uh, oriented while uh, Johnson had a lot of uh, uh, affiliations towards the Tory party. And maybe because of these reasons, maybe because he had managed to uh, offend the ruling uh, party right at the beginning of his literary career, he managed to receive, uh, re he managed to, uh, receive some sort of a recognition and financial assistance only much later in his life. During this period, we also find him establishing a connection with uh, uh, one of the former publishers of those times, Edward Kay, who also was uh, running this uh, particular magazine known as the Gentleman's Magazine. Uh, Johnson used to regularly contribute to the parliamentary uh, reports uh, for this magazines and it is uh, important to remember that during those times uh, parliamentary reporting was banned uh, but nevertheless he manages to uh, contribute to, to this column on a regular basis. Again, it is interesting to note that uh, Johnson himself was never in the gallery of the house, he merely worked up his debates from the notes of uh, others. So, uh, he, we also get to know about the kind of uh, uh, immense genius that he, uh, he possessed right from the beginning in order to uh, fashion everything according to his convenience and also begin to uh, write according to what the uh, public wanted. And uh, 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 an important note about this uh, particular magazine, the Gentleman's Magazine is that it ran for about 200 years uh, since it was established in 1731. This was quite a rare feat since most of the periodicals and magazines which began uh, in, in the early uh, phase of 18th uh, century and even in the early 19th century, they uh, could not manage beyond a few uh, decades at the maximum. Some of the other important writings of uh, Samuel Johnson uh, include one of his earliest defense of the Theatre's Licensing Act. This was uh, in 1737. He also writes a poem, uh, Vanity of Human Wishes in 1749, which, was also, which is also considered as one of the best of his uh, uh, poetic works. He, uh, in 1737, he wrote a tragedy uh, titled Irene. In 1750, just like Addison and Steele, we find him 
uh, uh, beginning this uh, uh, periodical title the Rambler. It was also an imitation of the Spectator. The Rambler used to appear on all Tuesdays and Saturdays till March 1752. He used to work on this single handedly and it was also quite uh, successful though it did not achieve the kind of popularity that Spectre, that uh, Addison's and Steele's uh, periodicals used to get. He also published two more periodicals titled The Adventurer and The Idler. Perhaps the most important work of not just Samuel Johnson but the most important work of the 18th century itself was the publication of a dictionary of the English language. The dictionary came out on 15 April 1755 in all, to also mark the beginning of a new phase in the history of English language. In June 1746, seeing the possibility of uh, standardizing English language, we find that Samuel Johnson, who was by, by then uh, quite a renowned figure in London, he was contracted by a group of London booksellers to write a dictionary. And he was offered uh, 1,500 guineas, uh, which, uh, which is equivalent to 1,575 pounds, and in today's terms, it would be 220,000 pounds. So, it was such an enormous sum of money which was offered to Samuel Johnson for beginning his work on this particular dictionary which was quite a novel work in English language then. During this time the French uh, people had already uh, come out with a uh, uh, dictionary of their own which was uh, published by their Academy of uh, Letters. But we find that these English booksellers they do find that there is a, a possibility of a new market in terms of uh, if, they, if they manage to come out with the dictionary. They also realize that this is a huge project, project which uh, uh, they cannot fund on their own. So, they uh, kind of come together form a collective and uh, commission Johnson to do that. Johnson also was quite smart enough to see the possibility and see the and also to identify a possible market in this and by 1747 we uh, begin to note that uh, he had written out a plan complete with his intentions and his methodology and he begins to, uh, he begins uh, to work on this though initially he uh, uh, he thought that he would be able to complete this work in about 3 years we see that he takes about uh, 7 to 8 years to complete this work nevertheless this is considered as one of his greatest contributions uh, to english language and literature he had worked on it single handedly and this was a remarkable feat not just during those times but even in today's terms. He only had employed some clerical assistants to help him with uh, certain clerical work and there was also several uh, revised editions which came, uh, which came out even after it was published in 1755. The this dictionary which was produced it was uh, very large and it was expensive. Uh, in terms of its uh, dimensions, it was 18 inches tall, 20 inches wide. It also used the finest quality paper available then. The, uh, the cost was one dictionary was about 1600 pounds. So, we do find that it was uh, very expensive and not affordable to the common reader. Only certain academies and institutions could uh, buy it then. What made Johnson's dictionary quite distinctive is that it was not just a set of definitions and meanings. It was also a rich mine of uh, quotations, uh, references and it was uh, also seen as, a, uh, as more of a uh, literary artifact than a linguistic artifact. You do find that it was uh, not just about meanings and etymologies, it was also about including a lot of references from uh, contemporary literary texts. Johnson's dictionary also has this rare distinction of having laid the foundations of English lexicography. Uh, though there is a criticism that this work was uh, quite weak in etymology and uh, philology, but uh, nevertheless we also need to keep in mind that these subjects were still in their infancy in the 18th century. Johnson's dictionary had a lot of uh, uh, very curious kind of definitions which were also uh, which were also which also had a tinge of humor in them. For example, he talks about lexicographer as a writer of dictionaries, a harmless drudge, and oats as a grain, which in England is generally given to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. This obviously also had irked the uh, Scottish people quite a bit. And patron is commonly a wretch who supports with insolence and is paid with flattery. If we, uh, this is a page from Johnson's, uh, this is a page from Johnson's uh, dictionary. Uh, for example, if we take a look at this, uh, uh, the meaning of the particular word oats, we find that apart from the meaning, he also gives a lot of references from certain contemporary texts. He quotes from Miller, Shakespeare, Locke, Mortimer and Swift. Yeah. So, this is uh, uh, quite, a, uh, quite an impressive archive 
of literary texts as well because he refers to most of the texts of those times which had some reference or the other to this particular uh, word oats. And we also um, it is important to note that uh, among his literary quotations he uh, quotes uh, he quoted Shakespeare more than any other writer. Here we also note that Johnson's dictionary which ran into multiple editions it also had a uh, a, a miniature form which was uh, which came out in 1796. So, we do find that this also was one of those books that people really wanted to own during those times because there was no other reference book which could be used in order to understand words, uh, usages, coinages and it was also an interesting uh, resource book for uh, referring uh, to various other forms of uh, uh, literature and writings. Boswell who wrote the biography of uh, Johnson, the life of Johnson, he uh, speaks about an interesting anecdote in the context of the writing of the dictionary. Allow me to read out an excerpt from this. Dr. Adams found him, that is Dr. Johnson, one day busy at his dictionary when the following dialogue ensued. Adam says, this is a great work sir, how are you to get all the etymologies? Johnson, why sir, here is a shelf with juniors and Skinner and others and there is a Welsh gentleman who has published a collection of Welsh proverbs, who will help me with the Welsh? Adams, but sir, how can you do this in three years? Johnson, sir, I have no doubt that I can do it in three years. Adams, but the French academy which uh, consists of 40 members took 40 years to compile their dictionary. Johnson, sir, thus it is. This is the proportion. Let me see. 40 times 40 is 1600. As 3 to 1600, so is the proportion of an Englishman to a Frenchman. With so much ease and pleasantry, could he talk of that prodigious labor which he had undertaken to execute? Here we also note that this was the kind of response that he had to any kind of situation no matter how difficult or how grand it was and this uh, he, uh, he thus also was rightly named as uh, he thus uh, was also rightly named as the greatest in that uh, particular age. One particular incident marked a lot of difference in terms of uh, the literary patronage system of the 18th century and this was Johnson's response to one of his uh, patrons. Johnson in fact uh, uh, was very late in getting any kind of patronage uh, from uh, the wealthy nobles of those times and we are noted many times at the earlier sessions that throughout history we find that always there were particular patrons or uh, wealthy gentlemen who were acting as uh, patrons to promote uh, arts, uh, literature, uh, culture etc. So, the artists were always at the mercy of these uh, powerful wealthy uh, uh, people and uh, when uh, Johnson began his work on this uh, particular dictionary, he had contacted Philip Stanhope, the fourth Earl of Chesterfield, who also uh, initially promised to help him out, but we find that for a long time he neglected him greatly and the, uh, the Earl of uh, Chesterfield also did not keep up his promise. And But however, towards the end of his work, when his, wor when his uh, dictionary was about to uh, get published, we find Chesterfield again approaching him and also offering to help him financially. Uh, however, in between he also, Chesterfield also had written uh, quite bitterly about the uh, ongoing work on the dictionary. Uh, in a uh, couple of newsletters and periodicals which were prevalent during those times. Johnson also harboured all of those uh, ill feeling against Chesterfield and just when Chesterfield offered some uh, amount of money towards the end of the completion of the work, Johnson uh, wrote this particular letter in response and this has also become quite uh, famous for the way in which a literary writer treated a, a patron of uh, a patron in the 18th century. So, this is how the letter reads, seven years my lord have now passed since I waited in your outward rooms or was repulsed from your door during which time I have been pushing on my work through difficulties of which it is useless to complain and have brought it at last to the verge of publication without one act of assistance, one word of encouragement or one smile of favour. Such treatment I did not expect for I never had a patron before. Is not a patron, my lord, one who looks with unconcern on a man struggling for life in the water and when he has reached ground encumbers him with help? The notice which you have been pleased to take of my labours, had it been early, had been kind, but it has been delayed and but it has been delayed till I am indifferent and cannot enjoy it, till I am solitary and cannot impart it, till I am known and do not want it. 
This particular letter which Johnson wrote to Chesterfield in the 18th century, it was a major event then. It was also an encouragement to many of the artists and writers of those times and it's also said that this event marked the death blow to the whole 18th century system of patronage. And the dictionary also made uh, Samuel Johnson financially quite independent. He began to even earn 300 pounds a year as pension. It, it also showed the other writers and uh, artists of those times that it's possible to earn one's uh, livelihood through one's uh, artistic and uh, uh, through one's artistic and literary means as well without completely relying on the wealth of the uh, patrons. Nevertheless, the dictionary uh, did have uh, some uh, limitations. Uh, the, the most important one was that it was not an exhaustive work compared to their uh, later works but however one also needs to keep in mind that uh, uh, however one also needs to keep in mind that Johnson worked with limited resources in the 18th century and, and the other important uh, fact was that uh, Johnson was uh, uh, John, Johnson was quite conservative in his approach of including words. Uh, for example, he only recognized a word as illegitimate only if it had uh, some respectable literary currency. Certain words which he thought were of low profile or did not have enough literary quality did not make it into his dictionary. For example, uh, because of those reasons, he had excluded words such as fun, uh, stingy and clever but we know that at a later point of time they all became uh, part of the uh, part of proper English vocabulary. Samuel Johnson also founded uh, the club uh, in 1764 this was mostly a literary club uh, uh, where the eminent personalities of those times used to get together have dinner together and also uh, discuss about the major socio-political affairs of those times. They used to meet regularly at the Turks in uh, at the Turk at the Turk's Head Inn in Gerard Street. The major members of this uh, club included uh, Joshua Reynolds who was a renowned painter of those times. He is also said to have uh, been one of the founding members of the club. Oliver Goldsmith, Edmund Burke, uh, Gibbon, Sir William Jones who was the uh, Orientalist, uh, Garrick the actor and also Boswell who was uh, a hero worshipping friend of uh, uh, Johnson who also later wrote his biography. The club's toast was Esto Perpetua, uh, when translated from Latin it was let it be perpetual uh, but, uh, but nevertheless we do find that uh, uh, the, uh, the club did not have a very long life. Uh, nevertheless it did contribute to a lot of uh, discussions and a lot of major thoughts uh, we can say that it had sprung from this club headed by Samuel Johnson. The other major works of Johnson include uh, Rasselas uh, which was a didactic novel which he published in 1759. It said that he had written off, uh, he had uh, written Rasselas quite quickly to uh, pay off certain debts that he had accumulated. And in this work we also find his uh, a sense of deep religious faith which he claims to have saved him from utter hopelessness throughout his life. In 1765, he also published an edition of uh, Shakespeare. In 1775, A Journey to the Western Islands of uh, Scotland, which was also more like a travelogue. In 1765, he published a Preface to Shakespeare, which is also considered as the first and major critical essay uh, on literature. Uh, this was uh, quite important and controversial in the sense that we find him slighting uh, Stern, who was uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, novelists. He undervalued Milton's work and he also displayed a lot of prejudice against uh, Swift. Uh, many feel that this was also because of the uh, political rivalries that they had during the time. In 1779-81, uh, we find him coming up with this uh, another significant um, uh, work on criticism, the lives of the most eminent English poets with critical observations on their works. In that sense, we find that uh, uh, we find that Johnson was important not just in laying the foundations of language, but also in laying the foundations of literary criticism of English literature. The most important work about Johnson has been his biography, written by Boswell in 1791, titled "The Life of Johnson." Johnson's style of writing was very different from that of his predecessors or of his successors which is why as we noted at the beginning he is also considered as one of the greatest uh, uh, men of letters. His vocabulary was very latinized and it was also pompous and heavy but at the same time it was not uh, flippant, it was not uh, superficial, it was also noble and dignified. Uh, this had prompted Macaulay to even coin a term Johnsonese to talk about this dignified and noble style of writing. Macaulay's observation about Johnson is uh, quite apt 
uh, as and when we begin to wind up this session. Macaulay uh, once wrote, the memory of other authors is kept alive by their works, but the memory of Johnson keeps many of his works alive. On this note, on this celebratory note about Samuel Johnson, we begin to wind up this session and we also, uh, we also shall continue to look at other eminent personalities of the 18th century who marked a transition towards the romantic uh, period of the 19th century. So with this, we wind up today's session. Thank you for listening. Look forward to seeing you in the next session.